All right, so Luke Acts for beginners. This is lesson number five. Jesus in Galilee, public ministry begins. And part three of that section, we're going to try to cover Luke chapter eight, verse four, all the way over to Luke chapter nine, verse 50. So in the introductory lesson at the very beginning of the course, I mentioned the fact that there's a lot of material contained in the book of Luke that also appears in Matthew and in Mark. Uh, the gospel writers, as I said, used one another's material uh, and sometimes they would use one another's material and then add details that the other did not add. Uh, I said that because of the length of Luke's record, 24 chapters, and the time limit of this class, 13 sessions, I would briefly review the passages already covered in Matthew and Mark's gospel and spend more time on the material unique to Luke or passages only repeated one other time in the book. It's a question of you know, triage, you know, which, which passages are more specific to Luke that we may not have seen in the other uh, gospels. So today we're going to look at the third section of the first main part of Luke's work and that is Jesus in Galilee. Uh, Jesus in Galilee, that's the first main section, goes from Luke 1.1 1, 1 to Luke 9.50. So we're in the last section of that main part. And in this third part, Luke 8.4 to 9.50, every event, every miracle, and every teaching is also contained in either or both Matthew and Mark, except for one passage at the very end of this section. So let's start um, uh, with um, Luke chapter eight, if you're following along in your uh, Bibles. We begin with the parable of the sower and the seed. Not going to read that, pretty familiar. I mean, not going to read it all right away. Uh, this parable is contained, as I said, in both Matthew and Mark's gospel. It's the first parable actually spoken. Of all the parables that Jesus spoke, this is the first one uh, that He speaks. So in verse four, when a large crowd was coming together and those from the various cities were journeying to him, he spoke by way of a parable. So Luke notes that Jesus' popularity is on the rise as people, not only from his own town, Capernaum, are coming out to hear him, but people from other cities as well are coming out to him. In verses five to eight, Luke recounts Jesus' parable of the sower sowing the seed on different types of soil. You remember this? On the rocky road, uh, excuse me, on the road, on the rocky soil, on the thorns, and then of course on the good soil. And the results of this, the, uh, the road, the rocky, the thorn, those type of soils, no growth. But on the good soil, uh, you know, a variety of, of growth that takes place. So let's skip ahead to verse nine and 10. His disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant. And he said, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. So since this is the first time that Jesus teaches using the parable style, his apostles want to know two things. One, the meaning of the parable, and why uh, has he begun using this style of teaching? So Jesus answers their second question first. Why parable? Why parables? Why are you teaching this? Uh, the word parable comes from a Greek word which means to lay beside. You have something and then you lay something beside it. That's what that word means, to lay beside. Uh, it was a teaching device used to compare ideas or things in order to provide <clears throat> excuse me, in order to provide greater understanding. In Jesus' case, he was providing a story about something physical that could be easily understood, a sower sowing seed, in order to teach them about something that they could not see and had trouble grasping, and that was the growth of the kingdom of heaven. So the apostles knew what parables were. Uh, it was a device commonly used by other teachers. It wasn't just Jesus using this, other teachers used parables as well. But they wanted to know why Jesus started using this particular device to teach the crowds. So Jesus explains that He's going to use this device to both teach His disciples about the growing kingdom, how it's established and how it grows and what's the purpose of His mission. 
and at the same time shield unbelievers and opponents from understanding the meaning of his teaching. In other words, they're just going to get the surface. They're not going to get the understanding. So in verses 11 to 15, he then goes on to give the deeper meaning. In other words, what the parable teaches about the kingdom. And this we have gone over. Uh, in, you know, Matthew explains this, Mark explains this. So we're familiar with this particular parable. Then he goes on to do uh, or to teach the parable of the lamp. Chapter 8, verse uh, beginning in verse 16. And he says, Now no one, after lighting a lamp, covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not be known and come to light. So take care how you listen, for whoever has, to him more shall be given. And whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, shall be taken away uh, from him. And his mother and brothers came to him and they were unable to get to him because of the crowd. And it was reported to him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wishing to see you. But he answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. So once Jesus has explained why he uses parables and how to interpret them, I mean, the way to interpret the parables is to realize that Jesus, he's the key. He's the key that opens the door to the meaning of all the parables. He follows up with another parable, a second parable that calls on them to do two things. One, to be ready to proclaim to the world the things that they will learn from Him. And secondly, be attentive to His teaching because the more you believe and learn, the more you will understand. And then on the other hand, the less you believe and learn, the less you will understand to the point where you will not believe and understand anything. So there's no, there's no static point in following Jesus. You're never, you get to a point and, and it's like, I'm good, I don't need any more. It's never like that. If you continue believing and seeking understanding, God will continue to give you understanding to enlarge your knowledge of Him and His will, and that in turn will strengthen your faith, will, which will build your hope, which will motivate your love. You know, it all works together as a process. But if you stop the believing, if you stop the understanding, if you stop taking in the word, then it simply begins to shrink down to the point where you no longer understand easily and then your faith begins to you know, shake and eventually you, know, you don't believe at all and fall away. So this last admonition to his disciples is a, a continuation of what he explained about his use of parables. Some, because of their belief in him, would gain more insight and knowledge from him. And those who didn't believe would only understand the story of the parables, but not the meaning which he provided. And the important thing is, understanding the meaning is what nourishes spiritually. I mean, if you understand the surface part of the parable, you're entertained. Oh, that was a nice story. Oh, that was, oh, yeah, I get that story. Oh, yeah, isn't that what life is like? That's all you get. But if you have the key, which is faith in Him, and go deeper into the parable to find the real meaning, that nourishes the spirit. And that's the difference. Eventually, the non-believers would lose interest altogether and completely miss the coming and the fulfillment of the kingdom. We see that later on, don't we? It's interesting to note here that Jesus uses the initial disbelief of his own family as a way to establish the importance and necessity of faith in him to access the things of the kingdom. His family want access to him, but they're not believers. And he said, this is my family here. These people who have come, you know, they've come to hear me, to hear the word, to learn from me. My family didn't come to do that. They just came to see me. And we find out in other places, they came to see him because, well, you know, this thing is getting out of hand. You need to come home. And so he's showing, you know, my own family, you know, they, you're my family. And I think a lot of people in the church you know, feel like that too. They have a physical family who are non-believers and they love them and they, of course, you know, they esteem their family and they're close to them, but their real family is the church family. They're the ones that they share their lives with and, and their faith with. So even his own family has to believe if they want to enter in. No partiality with God. So Luke changes scenes here 
and he describes in successive order three miracles that Jesus performs during a trip across the Sea of Galilee. Luke has uh, described several instances of Jesus' teachings and now follows up with a demonstration of His power that serves to confirm the credibility and the credentials of the teacher himself. It's one thing to have teachings, but why should we listen? Well, then you see the miracles and you realize, oh, okay, this isn't, this isn't just any teacher. This teacher is, is, is special. This teacher has power. So all of these miracles, again, are recorded in both Matthew and Mark. So we're only going to summarize and re review them. We're not going to read all the passages. We just don't have time. So the first miracle, is uh, Jesus stills the sea, chapter 8, 22 to 25. The first miracle takes place while they're in the boat crossing the lake according to Jesus' instructions. He said, let's go over across the lake. Luke says that Jesus went to sleep and after this there was a fierce storm that threatened to capsize the boat. It must have been a bad storm because several of the apostles were experienced sailors and yet they feared for their lives. So if the sailors are afraid, you, know, you better be afraid. Now Jesus, as we know, calms the storm by speaking to it, commanding it to stop, as opposed to various incantations or sacrifices used by pagan religions in order to influence the weather, right? A rain dance and whatever, offering up a virgin, something, you know, to, to appeal to the gods to stop the weather. Jesus simply says, stop that. <laughs> stop that, be still, and it stops. Now this isn't the first miracle they witness. You know, the water to wine in Cana, that was the first miracle. But this one is done in their own element. It's on the lake. And of a nature that other miracle workers in the past, you know, like the prophet Elijah, he had never done a miracle like that. This miracle forces them to reevaluate who Jesus really is. I mean, they're thinking, man, who is this guy who controls the wind and the sea by his word alone? I mean, is this just a teacher or a prophet, the Messiah? Is he more than this? So they, they came to him in fear, perhaps hoping he could pray and ask God to save them somehow, but they weren't ready for his reaction and the demonstration of his divine power. Hey, let's ask Jesus. He, you know, he's prayed and people who were sick got better. Maybe he'll pray for us and he'll save us from the storm. And Jesus completely surpasses their expectations by calming this, not by, well, I'll help you row. Let's get an extra man and let's row. We'll, we'll row to shore. No, he does the thing the least expect. He speaks to the wind and to the sea and he calms them. So Jesus merely rebukes the apostles for their lack of faith. Their fear was an indication of their lack of faith, he says. And he asks them, where is your faith? I wonder how many times Jesus asks us that question sometimes. After we've been through a difficult thing, whatever it is, illness, financial, career struggle, family, you know, just a terrible time. And we've gone through it for you know, a year or more or whatever and we've whined and moaned and got mad and done silly things and said silly things and given up and tried again. You know, we went through all the motions and then finally we hit that calm water again. And I wonder sometimes how many times Jesus said, where, where was your faith? Yeah, I get it. You're saying thank you now, now that everything is fine. You're saying thank you. There, your faith is fine now. Where was your faith during the storm? Second miracle, the demoniac cured. Chapter 8, 26 to 39, again, no time to read, but a familiar story. This is another miracle described, again, by both Matthew and Mark. The healing takes place once they land on the other side of the lake, where they were met by a demon-possessed man. Jesus has shown His power over the elements, and in this instance, He both converses with the demons and orders them out of the man and into the herd of pigs nearby. Again, we know that story. This not only demonstrates his power and authority over spiritual beings, but also that the man was actually possessed by evil spirits and not simply suffering from some type of mental illness. You ever wonder, well, why did he do that? That was such a strange thing. Because I've heard people say, well, all those demon possessed, that can all be explained away by modern psychology. 
he was psychotic, or he, was, you know, he had a psychotic break, or he was a schizophrenic. It can all be naturally explained. Really, how do you explain the part about the pigs running into the lake? How, how do you explain that, that conversation? It's also interesting to note that even though Jesus' closest disciples had not yet grasped who He was, the evil spirits not only knew who He was, but what their ultimate judgment and punishment would be. And of course that would be, they would be cast into the abyss. Verse 31, they say that, don't do that to us, not now. So Luke describes how the demon possessed man is immediately returned to his right mind and how the villagers are alerted after their herd of pigs ran into the sea and drowned after the demons entered them. The people react to their things, how? Same way as the apostles, with fear. And they ask Jesus to leave. And the man formerly possessed with the devils is sent back to his home region of Decapolis, meaning the region of the ten city, Deca, ten cities. And he's going to witness about his healing. Now in another book, Mark, chapter six, verse 53 to 56, Mark explains that later on Jesus returned to this area and this time was well received as people came to him for healing. So between the, between the lines, we understand that the groundwork for this was laid by the demon-possessed man who obeyed Jesus and returned to his home region to witness about his healing at the hands of the Lord. And so when the Lord came back to this region, the people were prepared and they received him. Then the third miracle, the woman with the hemorrhage and the, um, uh, the daughter, the young girl, uh, raised. Again, not going to read this, don't have time, a familiar, uh, a familiar story. Luke closes out uh, this section by describing two miracles you know, that are intertwined uh, that Jesus performed when He and the disciples cross back over the lake and return home. So a miracle on the lake, a miracle with the demon-possessed man on this side of the lake, they get back into the boat and they go over to the other side of the lake. When they get off the boat there, there's the woman with the hemorrhage and there's the synagogue leader. So the scene takes place several days after their return. We learn from Matthew 9 that after returning home, Jesus heals a paralytic. He calls Matthew into service. He dines at Matthew's house, which was by the Sea of Galilee. And that makes a lot of sense because as a tax collector, much of his business was to gather taxes at the port where goods were coming in and fish were sold and all that business. While he's teaching, a crowd of people who has gathered at Matthew's house in Capernaum, the leader or the elder of the local congregation named Jairus appears to him to come and to heal his young daughter who is at home dying of an undisclosed illness. So Luke forges several details because this incident is also described again in Matthew and Mark and so he summarizes the two miracles. So let's do Jairus' daughter. Jesus accepts to go to his house to heal the child. He's interrupted for a time by a woman also needing his help and during this delay the child dies. Jesus eventually gets to the house and he resurrects the child back to life. And then the woman with the issue of blood, it's interesting that Luke, the doctor, would add the detail that no one, not even doctors, could heal this woman who had suffered with this condition for 12 years. He's the one that gives us that detail, not the others. So she is healed when she touches Jesus' cloak and the Lord forces her to publicly acknowledge that she was healed in order to confirm her changed status from unclean to clean and to witness her faith in Him. Had she been healed and sneaked away, there was no way that the public would know that she was clean. She'd still be you know, divide, uh, separated from society. By, by acknowledging that she was healed publicly and going to the priests to you know, fulfill the, uh, the rituals involved, she was completely restored. Not only healed physically, but restored socially uh, to an acceptable position within her society. So Luke finishes with the description of Jesus' miracles and will now turn to the ministry that he will entrust to his apostles and disciples. So we go to chapter nine. Chapter nine, verses one to six, the apostles are sent out. 
Jesus has spent a considerable amount of time teaching, performing miracles, and preaching in His home region of Galilee. Before heading to Jerusalem and the greater challenges awaiting there, He instructs and sends out the apostles on their initial tour of ministry. Doesn't it make sense? It, it makes so much sense, doesn't it? Isn't that the way we would probably do something if we were organizing a team to do something, sell books door to door or canvas an area or whatever it is in a certain area? Wouldn't we show them how to do it and teach them and train them and the first time we send them out? Do, do Broadway shows open on Broadway? Well, no, they open off Broadway, right? Little theaters somewhere in New Jersey, somewhere in Oklahoma, you know what I'm saying? Small venues where they get the bugs out, where they get a little experience, you know, before they hit the big time. Well, they're up in the north. He sends them out in the north. First mission journey, not going to send them out in Jerusalem to face the priests and the Pharisees and the scribes, the big boys. No, 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 no. We're going we're to go to the small towns. We're going to go to the small synagogues. We're going to practice. Very normal way of approaching things. So in only a few verses, we see how thoroughly he equips them. In verse one it says, and he called the 12 together and gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. So he equips them with spiritual power which will give authority to their preaching. You know, people at that time could trust the message because they see the power behind the message. You know, you say, we, Jesus is the Son of God, He's the Messiah, prepare, the kingdom of God is at hand. And the people are going, yeah, sure, uh, uh-huh. Where'd you get that message from? And that, oh, and by the way, you know, the paralytic, you're healed. The blind person, you're healed. The sick person, you're healed. The person with dropsy, you're healed. Oh, okay, now the message begins to have some authority because of the power behind it. Today, the power is the gospel itself. And the miracle of the gospel is what? Not what I do. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. There's the power. Witnessed how? By our holy lives. Verse two. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. So he provides them with the content of their message. The kingdom is near. Today the message is that the kingdom is here. You need to enter it in, you, you, excuse me, you need to enter into the kingdom. Verses three and four. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, neither a staff, nor a bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not even have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that uh, city. So he supplies their provisions, the Lord will care for their needs. You know the fact of staying at one place, no begging door to door. We don't want you to be begging in the square, begging door to door, no, no. If you find someone who receives you, you stay there for the duration. Verses five and six. And as for those who do not receive you, as you go out from that city, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. Departing, they began going throughout the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. So he provides for their emotional needs, they will be rejected and even persecuted, but their response is not fear or revenge or guilt or disappointment. Their response is witness, witness. They are witnesses of judgment for those who received the message, but refused the message. Don't get mad, don't start a fight, don't get hurt, just understand that you've done your job. It's the same way today. Our job is not to save. Our job is to proclaim. If we have proclaimed and we have witnessed the proclamation with our own lives, we have fulfilled our ministry. How many people I know, oh boy, I've been working on my uncle 35 years, you know, and I brought him to church and I've preached the gospel to him and I've shown him the videos and the films, and, uh, you know, but I've failed. No, you haven't. He's failed, not you. You've succeeded, you've persevered in giving a witness, you've persevered in teaching and encouraging, you've persevered, he's the one who failed, he's the one who has refused the message, you've done your job. So the results of their ministry, verse seven to nine, 
It says, now Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was happening and he was greatly perplexed because it was said by some that John had risen uh, from the dead and by some that Elijah had appeared and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen again. Herod said, I myself had John beheaded, but who is this man about whom I hear such things? And he kept trying to see him. So their preaching was so effective that it reached the ears of Herod, who was the ruler of the Galilee region. Luke reports that this evil king was perplexed because he thought John the Baptist had somehow come back to life from the dead because he had had John beheaded. And being a superstitious man, he thought, uh oh, John the Baptist come back to haunt me. Another result, the people in the region. It says, when the apostles returned, they gave an account to him of all that they had done. Taking them with him, he withdrew by himself to a city called Bethsaida. But the crowds were aware of this and followed him and welcoming them. He began speaking to them about the kingdom of God and curing those who had need of healing. So as a result of their preaching, even more people were eager to see and hear Jesus. Not them. Their preaching was successful. They were bringing people to the Lord. They were not making disciples for themselves. The people wanted to see the Lord Himself now. And then of course we get to the 5,000 fed. Just put that up. So the apostles are sent out. We read about the results. Now Luke talks about the 5,000. Another episode that is described by both Matthew and Mark. Suffice to say that this gathering is another sign of Jesus' growing ministry and a direct result of the apostles preaching in the region. How else did they get together, you know, 5,000 men plus, how else did they get such a big crowd together? Well, they've been out on a preaching tour from town to town, synagogue to synagogue, town square to town square. Eventually what happens? Well, people come together. The miracle of the multiplication of the bread and the fish to feed 5,000 served the apostles by once again demonstrating Jesus' ability to meet every need in every circumstance. And it showed the people that His teaching was based on power as well, not persuasion. So the apostles did healings and that was encouraging. That you know, confirmed the word that they were preaching. But these people, you know, they have a history of, of prophets and miracle workers, you know, and they go, well, yeah, okay, you know, well, let's go see the big guy. Let's go see the person you're talking about. And they come to see Jesus, a huge crowd, and He does a miracle they had never seen before to demonstrate His power. So now we move to, you know, we've got the disciples making disciples, so Jesus has a warning, the cost of discipleship. So the scene changes and we find Jesus alone now with His disciples after these incredible events. So let's read a little bit. And it happened that while He was praying alone, the disciples were with Him and He questioned them saying, who do the people say that I am? And they answered and said, John the Baptist. And others say, Elijah. But others that one of the prophets of old has risen again. And He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. But he warned them and instructed them not to tell this to anyone, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. So Jesus gets to the heart of what He has been preparing them for. First, His identity, to recognize and accept that He is the divine Son of God. He's, he, he has a, plot, a plan, rather. He has a plan for His disciples of what they're to understand. And the other thing, His mission. His mission is the cross, to go to the cross, the death and the resurrection. Once revealed, Jesus then describes the true cost of being His disciples. And the true cost is everything that you have. Verse 23. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? 
For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory, and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I say to you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. So part of the training is to know the true mission and calculate the true cost of what the mission and the missionaries uh, will pay. All right, we move along, or Luke moves along. We're following Luke, we're not following me. I'm following him. Next, uh, the Transfiguration, chapter nine. Now I include the Transfiguration in the section on ministry to the apostles because three apostles are given an extraordinary opportunity to see Jesus in a glorified state. This experience should put beyond a doubt their previous confession that Jesus is the Son of God and as such shares a divine nature with Him. Remember, the, the big problem was not that the apostles believed that Jesus was the Messiah. They, they were accepting that He was the Messiah. The hard part for them to accept was that He was divine. That was the hard part. Now the prophets had said that when the Messiah came, the Messiah would be divine. And, and Luke you know, refers to this a little bit later on in his book. That was the hard part. So doing the miracles of the bread and the fish, yes, that, that more proof that he's special. He's not just a rabbi, not just a teacher, but truly this Messiah, this powerful prophet, if you wish. But bringing the three up to the Mount of Transfiguration and allowing them to witness his transfiguration, that's more than just proving to them that he is you know, a, a miracle worker. That's demonstrating to them something special about his essential being, that he's not just the Messiah, but he is the divine Messiah. They believed that he was the Messiah, but needed further proof concerning his divinity and Jesus goes beyond the performing of miracles in order to prove it. So let's read this passage. Some eight days after these uh, sayings, he took along Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different and his clothing became white and gleaming. And behold, two men were talking with him and they were Moses and Elijah who appearing in glory were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep, but when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with, uh, standing with him. And as these were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not realizing what he was saying. While he was saying this, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. Then a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and reported to no one in those days any of the things which they had seen. So after this event, we have the healing of the demon possessed boy. Again, in the order that Luke is laying all this out, chapter nine. So after this episode, Luke describes another miraculous healing of a demon-possessed boy that the apostles left behind had failed to heal. Unlike Matthew, Luke does not explain why. He only explains what Jesus does. Jesus, perhaps sensing that these events are making the apostles confident for the wrong reasons, reminds them again that he will eventually be killed. But they still don't understand. Let's face it, you're seeing your boss your leader doing miracles, feeding 5,000 people miraculously, appearing you know, uh, glorified like a, like a divine being, and he's your leader and you're his follower. Well, what else are you going to think? How else would a human being feel? I don't know about you, but I'd be thinking, boy, I, I have backed the right candidate. <laughs> I've got the right guy right here, imagine. I mean, he's, he's doing it all this and I'm one, I am only one, I'm one of only 12. One of only 12. You know, I could see the heads begin to swell and the, you know, the pride begin to puff. And of course, of course, what happens? Well, who is the greatest? <laughs> Who's the greatest? 
So Jesus' warning about His impending death in order to keep His apostles focused is confirmed here as the apostles, perhaps provoked by Peter and the others who witnessed the transfiguration, we saw something you didn't see. <laughs> we have an insight that none of you have. He brought us to the top, not you guys. I mean, it's, it's so human. They may have thought or argued that the greatest were those who performed miracles or witnessed visions or were favored by Jesus. Jesus reminds them uh, that the one who believes in simple faith without witness of miracle or visions has both the blessing of the Father and the Son. John, who was with Peter and James on the mountain of transfiguration, reveals their collective sense of privilege. We, we are Jesus' apostles. And how, do, how does he show this? The little story, they stop someone else who's doing miracles in Jesus' name. They stop him from doing that. And note that he says that this person does not follow us. They go to Jesus and they say, this guy over here is doing miracles in your name and he's not following us. He didn't say, but he's not following you. They say, he's not following us. All of a sudden, they're the ones getting a little too big. So the Lord answers John and closes this section with a mild rebuke, telling John not to create enemies out of people unnecessarily. So let's summarize, that was a five minute bell. So Luke finishes out this account of Jesus' growing ministry in and around his hometown of Capernaum by the Sea of Galilee. In our next lesson, we're going to begin the section where Jesus prepares himself and the apostles for the stiffer opposition they're going to face as they head for Jerusalem in the south. There are only a few of the many lessons, well, here are only a few of the many lessons that we can draw from the material we covered today, just two. Lesson number one, where's your faith? Mentioned that before, where's your faith? Jesus posed this question to his apostles after he calmed the storm. Faith is demonstrated during the storm of life, not during the calm sea. Ask yourself, where's my faith? Not, why isn't this storm over when things go wrong? That's the right question to ask during the storm. How is my faith responding to this storm? And not, please God, stop the storm. He knows the storm is there and he knows exactly how long the storm is going to last. No use asking him to cut it short or why or anything like that. You need to be asking yourself, ourselves, I include myself in this, how's my faith doing here? How am I doing here? Lesson number two, Jesus is never late. They told him it was too late, the girl had died. No use coming. Only those whose faith is weak see Jesus as being late or not fair or he doesn't care. But the reality is that Jesus is never late. He's never early for the faithful who wait on him patiently. His timing is always right, always. All right, next week, Luke 9.51 to Luke 11.54. That'll be the section that we cover as we continue our study, survey kind of a study, if you wish, through the book of Luke. All right, thank you very much for your attention.